another thing uh, I just put in this overhead, which I mean, the, the, the handout that you've got has four little graphs and tables that we'll use today. And after class, I'll go back and I'll paste this guy, the introduction in along with those onto a handout so you can download it from the, um, uh, from the web as well. Okay. But I put this little reminder because I've been trying to do some editing of the material we've done. And over on uh, UCTV, I've got a number of little supplementary things. So for example, um, the voluntary contribution mechanism game that we're kind of looking at now, uh, we did last year in a little bit more detail, okay, and a, and a little differently as well. So if you're finding, struggling a little bit with getting your head around what's going on with this, then have a look at, at uh, that clip from last year. Uh, similarly, uh, so we got lecture um, lecture five uh, on this bargaining game. We did in three minutes what we took 20 minutes last year to do, okay, where I did the little game tree and analyzed it out. So what I've done is I've put up a supplement uh, there which sort of extracts out, whoops, it's back up here, it extracts out the, um, oh, it should be up there. There's a supplement to lecture five, okay? I put it up there a few minutes ago, but it doesn't seem to be there. Anyhow, um, the, um, uh, there is this supplement. The reason it happens is that sometimes you access this stuff from the States, but you don't know it, and it takes 10, 15 minutes for the stuff to, a little while for it to get synchronized up there. Anyhow, there is a supplement which takes out the last 20 minutes of lecture five from last year on the voluntary contributions, or on the bargaining game, and um, we just kind of go through the analysis of that game tree a little bit slower. So if you're having any difficulty getting your head around the three-minute quickie version we did in Lecture 5 here, go back and look at that material, okay? And I'm, as we go through the course, I'm going to keep extracting the good bits from, from previous years that maybe even be better than this year, or a little bit deeper, a little different, where I'm structuring things a little bit different uh, this year. So, it, you know, there's some good stuff that happened last year. That's, uh, and I'd like you to be able to look at that. You can access this stuff online. Okay, uh, whether you're at home or whether you're inside varsity. So please have a look there. Now, let's go back to uh, today's material. If you remember, okay, I'm going to put this diagram, but don't copy it down because this is what we ended up with the last class, okay? And what we had was this, what we called the voluntary contributions mechanism game. The basic concept was people could give and get something back, okay, themselves. However, if you gave a dollar, you know, it went into a pot which got expanded, so your dollar goes to a dollar fifty, but you personally only get half of that back, the other half goes to somebody else, okay? And that was the idea of, well, you can help out other people. Now, in our example, it's just one other person, but you can imagine giving a dollar having it multiplied by uh, going up 50%, you getting back 75 cents, and everybody else getting back 75 cents in this room. Okay. So we're just looking at a two-player game, two players, but you could sort of think of a mini-player game where, gee, you could do something which would benefit a lot of other people, but it's going to cost you. Okay. So that's the basic idea. And so what we did is we simplified it, and we, we said that you could um, give nothing or give everything each of the players can. We looked at these various payoffs. We looked at these best response ideas uh, where we, I'll run over this again as we expand the, the, the payoff table. But the basic idea is for the red player, you know, you're trying to decide whether to give everything or give nothing. So you, you think, I don't know what the other guy is going to do. Doesn't it depend? Well, it might. Uh, and you think, well, if they give none, what's my best response? Well, I should give none. I'm just a sucker, really, to give everything, you know, because I'm only going to get three, whereas I've given none, give four. And if they give everything, well, I could give everything like them and be a nice guy, but I'm kind of tempted by this extra chocolate bar or money or whatever the higher payoff I've got. So we've got a temptation, and here we succumb to it because we're thinking these payoff numbers reflect what the pay red player's preferences are. So seven is better than six. 
four is better than three, and we put these little zeros there because they're just an idea of a best response. It's in our head. We don't actually respond to anything. We're just thinking about what the other player might do. Okay? Um, if the other player does, gives none, then our best response here is to give none. If the other player gives everything, a red player's best response is to give none, again, given these payoffs. And gee, the giving nothing is always the best response, so we call that a dominant strategy. Okay? And then we did the same for the blue player, but we used X's, so we use knots and crosses. And we'll be trying to be systematic throughout uh, uh, the class, because when you see these little payoff tables, sometimes they get large. And the first thing you should do mechanically is go through and do your best response analysis to figure out where are the best responses of each of these players to what the other players can do? Okay? And that's part of realizing the other guy is an intelligent player. Okay? You're an intelligent player. Each of you is going to be thinking about this game intelligently. And you're, you've got these preferences, and we suppose that everybody in the game knows them. So we don't have to just say, well, anything could happen. Yeah, anything could happen. You know, lots of stuff can happen here. But if you take into account the other player is rational and they're intelligent, then what will their best responses be? You know, so if you're the red player, you might be thinking, well, what's a blue player going to do? Well, the blue player is going to be looking at what I'm going to do and trying to figure out what their best response are. So I can see as a red player, the blue player's best response is to give none. If I give none, if I give everything, a blue player's best response is giving none as well. So I could think, oh, they've got a dominant strategy, giving nothing. It could be nice and give everything. But if this is the payoff table, then they're going to give nothing. And what's, that's what I should expect. Okay? So I'm going to expect them to give nothing. And if I expect them to give nothing, I've already worked out that I should give nothing. And the new player can go through exactly the same reasoning. Now notice what they're trying to do is put themselves in the position of the other player. What's the other player going to think? And the other player is going to be trying to think about what the first player is going to think. And you've got that circularity. But if you've got dominant strategies, you expect other people to play them. And we get... No charitable giving, okay? At least in theory, that's... Now, in practice, what happened in our game and what happens in many of these games uh, is that there is some charitable giving. People do give to other people. And one of the, one of the problems that we had in the, all the way through here is to figure out, are these outcomes in money terms or payoff terms, are they the real payoffs of people? I mean, and this is kind of significant in the sense that you're sitting here thinking, okay, if I make a contribution to the group account, you know, I only get back a little bit. It's going to cost me something. But I might help another hundred people. Okay? If I, you know, okay, if it's going to cost me 25 cents to put 75 cents in every one of your, your pockets, it's like, I could be really <laughs> self-interested and think, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. But you think, wow, there's, you know, a hundred odd people in this class, each of them getting 75 cents from what I contribute, that's pretty, you know, that's nice for them, not so much for me, because it's going to cost me. And that's the problem. If you're, if you're looking at it just from your perspective, then, and, and, and these numbers reflect our payoffs, uh, then you don't want to you know, give very much. But in, in reality, that is, if we really knew what people's payoffs are, they are willing to give something to other people. And that's typically what happens in these, these experiments. And often, you know, telethons, charitable fundraising, people give. They don't just free ride on what others do. However, we got to take the free riding idea seriously, um, partly because people are self-interested, but also partly because there's a limit to how much they want to give. If it costs too much to give, you know, and for example, um, uh, for about 20 years, um, I gave to a, um, uh, a sort of an overseas fund to help out a, you know, an underprivileged child in an underdeveloped a, a, a country. And one of the reasons I kept subscribing to that service was I thought, well, Okay, you know, I give my 20 bucks a month. I, I think at least half of it is going to get to the kid, you know. Whereas sometimes when you're giving stuff like that, you wonder how much actually gets to the recipients of the aid. And, you know, if you don't think, like in the, uh, if, if you don't think your giving is going to contribute to the people you want to help, then it's going to be, you're not going to do it, okay? So, so what we found here is that the, um, the equilibrium or the prediction with these payoffs is to give none. But we also saw that if somehow these people had been able to cooperate and enforce an agreement, that is, if they did something other than the rational thing to do, they actually could have both been better off. Now notice this. When I say both better off, I'm saying that the red player could have got a payoff of six. The blue player could have got a payoff of six. Get it? 
they're, they're both better off than they are in the situation we predict is going to happen, the dominant strategy, the rational thing to do. What is this? People are rational, they're intelligent, but they get stuck in this bad outcome. Okay, where they could both be better off. Now notice, notice this both be better off, it's actually possible for the red player to even be better off himself than he could be at six, because if they both give, then he's got an incentive to give none and go up to seven. The other guy goes down to the three, but that's, you know, in these payoffs, you're saying, well, I don't worry about that. Okay, so it's not, it's not like this is the best, because the best for the red is over here. The best for the blue is over there. But this one is definitely better than that one for both of them. Okay, so that's what we mean. When we're looking at patterns of cooperation and conflict in games, you know, what we're looking at is there's, there's potential here for both players to be better off. There's also for one to get ahead at the expense of the other. What happens? Well, here we get what's called the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, and the prisoner's dilemma comes from another classic game, which I expect you to read in the text, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got a, um, uh, a little homework exercise. Uh, the, the classic prisoner's dilemma is two people, um, they're arrested and they're suspected of a crime, but the prosecutor can't really convict them. They've got quite enough evidence. If they both deny it, then they're going to get off lightly, okay, a, a year's sentence. And, uh, but if they both confess, then they're both going to go to jail for a long time, eight years. Okay? Um, on the other hand, if one confesses and the other doesn't, the one who con confesses is going to get off scot-free and not have any um, go to jail at all, and the other guy's going to get 10 years. So what I did is I drew a little payoff matrix. Yeah. Come on down. There's, uh, you guys want to move in a little? If you got a little space there, there's someone at the back. Um, just slip in one level or something like that. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so. This is the classic prisoner's dilemma. Um, the story originated uh, back in the 50s when people were talking about uh, a brand corporation about uh, dilemmas that you could find yourself in and strategic dilemmas. And this was, it, it's just a, a classic idea that uh, there's a dominant strategy uh, for each player to actually um, deny, to confess being involved, okay? And when they confess, they're both gonna get a really bad outcome. Where if somehow they've been able to talk with one another, maybe, or maybe make an agreement with another, they can force, maybe, they could have both said, okay, we'll just, you know, let's not tell the guy what uh, really happened, and we'll deny it, and we'll only get one year in jail each, okay? Um, sounds good. You agree to it, you know? Then you go to talk to the prosecutor and the prosecutor says, you can get off scot-free. Yeah, okay, you know? Um, so I'll, I'll confess, uh, rat in the other guy, he goes to jail. Now, most of us, because we're familiar with watching all kinds of television programs, would realize you don't do that because what you're worried about is either in jail or when you get out of jail, there's gonna be some retaliation, okay? Now that's kind of, that's a different game. It could be a repeated game. You're gonna have some other interaction with this other player. But this is a, it's this person's dilemma is a one-shot game. Okay, there isn't any future to it. These are the payoffs right now, okay? And you get stuck, uh, you know, walk through the analysis, do the best response reasoning, figure out their dominant strategies, just to make sure that you can uh, uh, understand that classic prisoner's dilemma game. Now, on your handout, what I did is I, I want you to think about these games now in a slightly different way. Um, we're, we're seeing, with the P structure of the game, we got who are the players, what can they do, what their information is, and what their payoffs are. And often in a game, what we're interested in is, okay, there's some potential for conflict, there's some potential for cooperation, we're gonna have a prediction of what happens. Is that kind of good or bad for both players? And what we did with our little payoff matrix is we went through the, the analysis and we saw, well, the outcome we predicted would happen would be bad in the sense that there's something 
else they could have done that didn't actually happen in this game, some other strategies that could have been played, and everybody could have been better off. Okay? But we didn't get there. So what we do is we, we take this payoff table and we translate it into a, a graph. And on this axis, we put one player's payoff, the red players, and on the other axis, we put the blue player's payoff. And then we just plot these numbers. Okay, again, like it's, there's going to be simple little integer numbers in this course. Okay, and so the four and the four, it comes down right here. The six and the six is stuck out over here. The seven and three and seven and threes are on either side. Okay? Now I put these little lines through the, um, these points because if you look at the total payoffs, you can see that 6 plus 6 is 12, 7 and 3 is 10, 7 and 3 is 10, 4 and 4 is 8. The 6 and 6 payoff lies along an aggregate payoff, which is if you wanted to sum up these payoffs. Now, just put a little quotation mark around that, a little question mark, why would I want to add these numbers? Um, and, but supposing you thought of these as some kind of a, maybe a money payoff. Okay. Or maybe a chunkle bar payoff. Something you could, it makes sense to add up in. You think, well, the total gains here are 12. The total gains here are 10. The total gains here are 8. And if we look at these numbers, you know, do you think, well, why don't we get, we, we get a miserable gain of 8 and it's split equally. We could have got 12 and that could have been split equally. Okay. And so these lines we would think of as what we call the surplus available in the gain. It's kind of in the game. It's like, an aggregate surplus. It's, it's, a, it's something that is a sum total that somehow, if we could divide it up, you know, well, we can't. Like if we had 12 in total, we could go down here to 12 and 0. We, could go up, we think we could go up here to 0 and 12, whatever. But really, in this game, we can only get equal 6 and 6. Okay? And in this game, we can, we can only get those four dots. And what happens is our equilibrium is stuck down here. You see, and it's kind of a, once you see the graph, you sort of see, oh, okay, individually rational action leaves us to kind of a crazy cooperative outcome in that it's bad for both players. You know, it's bad in terms of the aggregate that gets divided between them. It's only 8, it could have been 10 or 12. It could have been, but it wasn't. And we wouldn't predict that it would be because we don't expect people to be able to, to strategically cooperate on this uh, um, giving everything outcome. Now, remember the very first bargaining game we had? Uh, I mean, the very first class. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to draw this graph, okay? It's, it'll be on the handout after when I put it up in the web. But you could think of that bargaining game as the same way. You know, we had a total pie. And um, the total pie could be divided by, you know, we could give some to x, we could give some to y, and this line x plus y equals the total is just, okay, that's the possibilities. And then in that division of the total pi, red might be able to get a minimum amount. Blue might be able to get a minimum amount. And so red's outside options say, you've got to give me at least this much. Blue's outside option, give me that much. And this little green shaded region is kind of, oh, that's kind of the pi, which we could all share if we could ever get there. Now in the prisoner's dilemma, we get stuck like at a, a, at a um, um, at a cell like this, for example, you give yourself, um, you give none, as a red player, you can guarantee yourself four, okay? You might get four or seven, but you're going to guarantee yourself four no matter what the other guy does, okay? So you think that's, that's as good as, I've got to get at least that much. Well, a similar kind of reasoning can go in the bargaining games. Now, behind the bargaining games are all these complicated trees that we, you know, centipede game and the, the alternating offer bargaining game. But at the end of the day, there's a bunch of stuff that's going to be divided by these. We try and, we use this bargaining arrangement, just this little graph, to sort of get a picture of, well, where are the possibilities for conflict and cooperation? Um, now, that, it's, it's a very simple little graph, but it's actually quite profound. Okay, we, we will come back to the bargaining idea later on in the term. But uh, in the last few years, I, I've been really interested in the uh, controversies over, over the high country land in New Zealand. So you go up to Tekapo, or you go to Wanaka, or you go to Queenstown, you see all that beautiful mountains and uh, the, uh, the lakes and the rivers. And a lot of it was publicly owned land. It was under a long-term pastoral lease to um, 
if, you know, it's been these leases have been going on for, for centuries. But over the last 15 years or so, there's been about a million hectares of that that has been privatized. Now, what's a hectare? A hectare's like two rugby fields. Okay, so we got two million rugby fields worth of beautiful property that's been privatized, sold off. And um, there's, uh, there's quite a controversy, one over the fact that it's being sold off, and the other is the money that's being, the bargains that are being extracted and exchanged. And as it turns out, the Crown has been a very poor bargainer in these transactions. I mean, you imagine, I don't know if you've been to Wanaka, okay? Have you ever been to Lake Wanaka? Absolutely stunning. You know, you sit there on the lake shore, look up uh, to the mountains. It's uh, on your left-hand side, there's um, some land. And, it, and if you go driving along left-hand side up to Trouble Cone, I think you go through... Um, uh, it was a motor camp, Glendu motor camp, something like that. It's on the left-hand side. Um, 3,000 hectares of that lakefront property, uh, the Crown paid the pastoral lessee money to take that off their hands. That stuff is worth its weight in gold. Anywhere on Lake Wanaka down there would be worth multi-millions, right? Okay. Well, so we're looking at the bargaining process of all of these transactions between the Crown and the various landholders, and you can you can look at other transactions. For for example, um, one of the puzzles in this is the Naitahu had a land claim back in 1987 when they opened the Waitangi tri Tribunal up, and it didn't actually get the, their claims didn't actually get settled. I think it was about 96, 97. But they had a land, land claim to almost all of that pastoral lease land, about 80% of the South Island. And uh, when you read the stories, uh, I would say that uh, in terms of any kind of fairness or justice, the Naitahu should be owners of that land. Other people have leased it in the interim. There may be some, there's some things that have to be worked out. Anyhow, Naitahu actually gave up their claim to that land. I'm thinking, well, how did that happen? Well, that's the... It, it, we, we use this kind of bargaining model to try to understand, like when there's two parties that are bargaining, you know, like the Naitahu also got a lot of stuff in their, in their settlement, and so somewhere along the line they must have felt it was worthwhile to give away their claims to this land in return for, say, claims to the, to the um, uh, offshore fishing stuff that they got, okay, or the, the wealth from that. I mean, I don't know, but when you're analyzing the bargaining situation, the idea here is to try to think at what's the total pie that's available between these people? Do they have mechanisms that will allow them to bargain successfully to kind of at least get to the total, or do they get stuck down here like in a prisoner's dilemma situation where they, they don't share much, okay? And it turns out these outside options are a key idea of the bargaining. We don't have to worry about those right now, Dad, but just coming back to our simple voluntary contribution scheme, we can think of it as a division of a bunch of stuff. The stuff is benefits between various people, but if we add the benefits up, we could think of a total stuff that could be divided. Now, what I did is I asked you in last time in, um, to expand the game, change the game, by thinking, well, supposing In this public good game, you know, it's not all or none. I can give a little bit, okay? Like, sure, you've got your endowment of four, and the other person's got their endowment of four. But, you know, maybe, maybe by dividing it up, instead of making all or none, we could actually get some giving so people could give a little bit. Okay, well, let's have a look and see. Well, so what you do is you, in these simultaneous games, and again, you go through the structure of the game. It's exactly what we had with the other... Uh, PDIP for the um, all or none game, except that we've got two players, and what can they do? They can give to a public good out of an endowment they have, or they can keep some themselves. But here they don't have to give all or none. The red player can give zero, give one, give two, give three, give four. The blue player can give zero, give one, give two, give three, give four. Okay? And then we have the, exactly the same process where whatever is going into, the, um, into this group account grows. Okay, magically, in the, in the experiment, it's me you know, putting in 50% more. But um, the idea is, you know, when you're, when you're building a park like, like Hagley Park, um, you put in some resources, and wow, lots of different people can benefit from it. Okay, so that's, the, that's what we're trying to capture here. And so we have the, the basic payoff table. Now, if we get rid of this, uh, and I put the numbers in for you so you don't have to uh, work this out. But there is a, there's sort of a, 
there's a lot of numbers to write down in there. If I have to ask a question in the exam like this, I'm going to give you a lot of the numbers so you don't have to calculate them, because otherwise you're going to be spending you know, 20 minutes trying to figure out a, a big payoff table. But I would like you, once you get the numbers, to be able to analyze the payoff table. Okay? So let's go through how we actually get these, uh, get these numbers. Well, often it's easy to work with a diagonal element. Like, you think, okay, suppose they both give nothing. They each keep their four. There's nothing in the group account, so their payoffs are four. If they each give one, that's two in the group account. Fountain multiplies it by 50%, brings it up to three. They divide it by two equally, so it's 1.5. So they get their, their three that they're now left with, plus the 1.5, it goes to 4.5. Similarly, period to five, to 4.5, to six. Okay, let's just think of this, this diagonal number six again. What is it? Well. You're giving your whole endowment into the group account. The other person's giving their whole endowment. That's eight. Well, 50% of that is four. Eight plus four is 12. But you split that equally, so you get six each. Okay? Now, you've given everything away, so you have nothing private to add to that, but you each get back six. Okay? So that's, that's the diagonal. Let's have a look at the bottom row. The bottom row if we start off from the left, we think, okay, suppose nobody gives anything. Okay. And then we have the blue player giving one. Okay, so you're the blue player, you're giving one, that means you've got three left. The other guy gives none, so there's one going into the group account, gets multiplied by 50%, so the whole thing goes up to 1.5, divided by two is 0.75, which you share equally. So the red player goes up to 4.75, you as the blue player, have, by contributing one, have helped out the red guy payoffs to move from 4 to 4.75. Unfortunately, uh, it cost you 25 cents to do that, right? And why is that? Well, you put in one, but you only got back 75. Okay, so you have your private cost of giving to other people. And if you, if you move along to the next cell, you notice it goes up by 0.75, down by 0.25. Up by 0.75, down by 0.25. Up by 0.75, down by 0.25. And that 0.75 and the 0.25, once you get that pattern in your head, you think, oh, every time this, the blue guy gives an extra dollar okay. into the account, he's going to increase the payoff for other people, there's only one other guy here, by 75 cents. Okay. And so that's, that's kind of the nice thing about it. You're helping out somebody else by 75 cents, but there's a cost to you. Okay. You're giving a dollar and you're only getting back 75 cents. Your return is kind of like negative. Okay, so we can do the same with if we, if we thought the red player. And now in some of these games, matter of fact, many of them we play, they're called symmetric games. So once you get the payoffs of the blue player here, you can, they'll be exactly the same flipped around for the red player. Okay, now let's go up here. Blue player is giving none, red player is giving one. So gets back 75 cents, three put 375. But he helps the other blue guy out to 475. He gives two, costs him 50 cents, but he brings the other guy up to 5.5. Blah, 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 all the way up here to the top where he gives everything, but the other guy gives nothing. So anyway, he, he only gets $3 back. He does help out the other guy to the tune of seven. Okay? So there's that that same pattern on here, now we're increasing the blue guys by 0.75 and the red guys going down by 0.25. So going up this way and going across that way, if you recognize that pattern of 0.75 and 0.25, you can fill out the rest of the cells. So for example, let's take the middle column. Okay. If you like, you can start off from the, the middle here where they're both giving two. So there's four into the account. It goes up 50% to six. So there's three coming back each, but they each given in two, so they only have two left. Three and two is five. That's where you get the five, right? Okay, now, if the red player starts to give, it costs him 25 cents to give the other guy 75. It costs him 25 cents to give the other guy 75, okay? If he reduces his giving, okay, he goes up by 25 cents, and the other guy goes down by 75 cents. Okay, let's see how that works. Okay, here he's giving one. The other guy's giving two. So there's three in the pot, goes up to 450 with the dollar 50 increase. Uh, split that is uh, uh, 225, 450, 225. Okay, I know the math is getting a little complicated now. It's not just integers, but at least it's divisible by five. Okay, and so um, 
he's given one, he has three, he gets 225 back, that gives us 525. Okay. And similarly, coming down here, by, by reducing his giving, he's giving, gets a 25 cents back, if you like, but he cuts the other guy back by 75 cents. Okay. And you could fill out all of the cells like that, which, go back and check them, okay? And this is what you get. You get a table that looks like this. And you think, oh, okay, it's kind of messy. As long as you get the calculations right, and look, at the, the calculations, um, you know, you can, if you're doing these things on an exam, you can get it wrong. If you make a mistake on, on, in calculating a table, but you go and analyze it right, I'm going to give you at least 80% for that, okay? I, I mean, everybody will make kind of, maybe even 90%. Everyone will make silly little calculation mistakes. Uh, I may have on this table here. You might be able to point them out, okay? But once you've got that table, you want to try to analyze it. So here's our payoff table. This is the payoff table to the, the, to the public good giving game. Uh, and it's a little more complicated, but you know, okay, we can look at it. We can, we can put our X's and O's in. So, um, I'm going to put in a column of X's over here, okay? And why am I doing this? Because I'm thinking, I want to look at this from the blue player's perspective, okay? If the red player gives four, what's the blue player's, what can the blue player get? Well, they can get seven if they give none. They can get 6.75 if they give one. They can get 6.5 if they get 2. They get 6.25 if they get 3. They get 6 if they get 4. And you think, well, okay, they're, I don't know what the other player is going to do, but if they give everything, my best response would be to give nothing as the blue player because that gives me the highest payoff. What about if the red player gave 3? Well, if the red player gave 3, look at these numbers all the way across, which is highest? Oh, okay. 6.25 is highest. To give 2. What's the highest going out across here? Just looking at the blue ones. Remember, I'm ignoring the red ones, right? I mean, as a blue player, I'm saying if the red player is giving two, I want to concentrate on my payoffs, which, well, if I give one, if I give two, if I give three, if I give four, best response is to give none. And that holds for every one of these rows, okay? So what, what I'm doing as the blue player is I'm saying, Fix a strategy for the red player. I don't know what they're going to do, but I can think about what they could do. Look at my payoffs from all the things that I can do, giving, giving zero, giving one, giving two, giving three, giving four. Identify the best response and just do it mechanically. Okay? And notice they all line up in the same column. So uh, what we have is what we call a dominant strategy for the blue player. I mean, the, the dominant strategy, the strategy is what you'll do, but you've thought it through, so it's like no matter what the other guy does, this is the best thing to do. Okay, normally you would think, when you're thinking of what's the best thing to do, you'd say, well, if he does this, I should do that, and if they do this, I should do that. You know, it changes, but here it doesn't change. Because then the blue player, again, has a dominant strategy of giving nothing. The red player, similarly, we put all these O's down here, and again, let me just walk you through the logic of this. We're, we're trying to figure out the red player's best response. So what, the red player doesn't know what the blue player is going to do, so he says, well, what if the blue player gives zero? Then I look at, I get four, 375, 350, 325, three. Oh, four is the biggest? Go for it. Okay. If the red, blue player gives one, so I'm looking up to the column, but I'm looking at the red player's payoffs because the red player is the one who's deciding you know, trying to think through, what should I do? Zero, one, two, three, four, what am I going to give? Well, 475 is the biggest number. So what we have is a pattern of zeros, which is gives us a dominant strategy of the red player, and we put a little circle around the payoffs to help isolate the place where the best responses both occur. Now, the concept of a mutual best response is a Nash equilibrium. Okay? Now, remember, it's a mutual best response of strategies. Strategies are in your head, right? Nobody's seeing, they're not making best responses to what other people are doing because they can't see them, but they can think about what they are. It's like, oh, a strategy is a complete specification of what I would do in all the circumstances I find myself in, and I'm thinking, well, if this guy does this, then I would do that, if he does this, I would do that, okay? And we come up with a, this cell, is in what we, a prediction of the game. It's an equilibrium. And in 
and particularly it's an equilibrium and dominant strategy. About in many games, there won't be dominant strategies. But if people have dominant strategies, you should expect them to play them. Okay, so that's like one of the first kind of strategic rules in these simultaneous games where you can't see what other people are going to do is try to identify whether they have a dominant strategy. If they do, expect them to play it. If you have a dominant strategy, you should play yours. And you should expect other people to expect you to play that. Okay? And here, they both have dominant strategies. If everybody expects everybody else to play them, then I'll be expecting the red player to play give none uh, as a blue player. The, the red player will be expecting the blue player to give none. Uh, given what we expect, that we're each making the best response by giving none. That's, an Ash, that's what we call an Ash equilibrium. It turns out it's also a dominant strategy equilibrium because these players have dominant strategies. Now, let me just get rid of some of these... Uh, little arrows, because I want to, again, I want to change the game. We're going we're gonna to take these basic games and make them a little bit more interesting and a little bit more fun, okay? Uh, just, just before we do that, just remember, we have... Um, once we've identified what we think will happen, we want to look for, well, are there other things that could have happened where everybody could have been better off? And, well, yes. <laughs> if if, if there had been any equal amount of giving by both of them, sliding up along here, everybody could have been better off okay, if, they, if they each gave one. Just a little bit, okay? If they each give just a little bit. And then you say, well, why don't, everybody, why, doesn't, why don't people just give a little bit? They'd both be better off. Well, because if you expect the other guy to give a little bit, then you're still better off by giving none at all, and vice versa. So you, you wouldn't expect that to happen. Now, it turns out that this uh, cell up here we call Pareto efficient or the most efficient, okay? Now, if you, if you go back and draw the little payoff uh, diagram I did where you put the red player's playoffs in the right-hand axis and you put the blue player's playoffs in the left-hand axis and you put all these dots in there like that, you'll see that this is that little dot, six and six, on that line that sums to 12, okay? And it's the only one in this table that actually sums to 12. All the other cells sum to something less if we put little diagonal lines here, you can add them up, okay? The, the total is the maximum here, okay? And it, shared, it, it turns out to be shared out equally. So, remember, again, to, once you identify a prediction, you want to say, okay, are they doing the best they can? Or, I mean, is it a, are there any outcomes where everybody could be better off? It's just something that you look for, okay? The problem with congestion is really that kind of problem. You know, everybody's making their choices to drive home at the same time. You know, every time I get on that road, I'm increasing all of the rest of the people's time to get home by just a little bit, you know. And they're doing the same thing for me. And we're all in this big congestion game, making our best response, all trying to get home at the same time. It's just there's some way we could kind of get some people to hang back a little bit, then everybody could be better off, okay. But we don't expect that to happen in this game. Uh, Okay, so let me get rid of this little label, and I'm going to change the game now. Now, we, we, sometimes what works for charitable contributions is you set a target, okay? Like, um, uh, I live out in Governor's Bay, school's got a fundraising drive, you know, they need to raise several million dollars, so, boom. Here's the target that we're aiming at. Okay, now one thing is that that's a bit of communication, right? Which we don't have in our game yet. Okay, so you could ask the question, does, does communication facilitate giving? And it turns out in, in, it does. Okay? But there's more than communication going on here. Supposing that you had this thing that said, look it, okay, if everybody contributes, uh, so the total is four. Okay, so we're getting at least four, then we'll go ahead with this thing. If we get more than four, all the better. We can build a bigger park. Okay. But if we don't get at least four, you get your money back. You go back to square zero. Okay. So that's called, um, we're, we're putting in a provision point, and it turns out that makes quite a difference to the game. So what I did is I, I, I put in gray here all of the cells were getting at least four. So along this cross diagonal here, um, we're getting four and zero, three and one, two and two, 
one and three, zero and four, from the different people, getting a total of four, okay? So basically the public good is gonna go ahead, and once it goes ahead, all the payoffs are the same up here as they were otherwise, but not below. Below, if we don't get the minimum threshold, everybody goes, they get their money back, whatever they would have contributed, and they go back to their private little endowments, okay? Now, what I'd like you to do is take this, let me get rid of this little cell down here. What I'd like you to do is take this kind of payoff matrix, I mean, I'll put it up on the web after so you don't have to turn and write all the numbers down, and figure out what the pattern of mutual best responses are. And you'll see that people don't have a, they don't have the dominant strategies they had before. So for example, let's look at the two and two situation, okay? So we're sitting here like this. If I'm the red player going up and down, I'm thinking, well, if I expect the other guy to give two, what's my best response? Well, my best response is to give two now. I think, oh, that's kind of cool. We changed the game, and now we've made it in the interests of well, we got rid of the dominant strategy problem for the red player and, and for the blue player, okay? Work out all of the best responses, and you'll see that we've kind of created another problem, which is a coordination problem, which we're going to address when we, when we um, come back tomorrow. Okay? Again, I'll put this up in the... Uh, uh, I'll put this up on the, um, on the web just after class. Good grief, what's happened here? I must have moved it. Whatever, okay. The one I give you on will, will be better than that. And what I want you to do is think through, is there a dominant strategy? Okay, and I've just argued there isn't a dominant strategy. And why is that? Well, that's because um, the red player's best response to a blue player paying two is two, but his best response to, say, the blue player giving nothing is four. So it's sort of, oh, okay, well, the other guy's not, you know, the other guy's not gonna give, then I'm not gonna give, okay? Um, but if he does give, then I'll give. So that's where we get a different kind of analysis that comes out of best response. Um, but if you go, I want you to go through this analysis, okay? Because you're gonna see there's a whole bunch of places where there are mutual best responses, which creates another problem, what we call a coordination problem. 